If you haven't heard about Anchor by Spotify, it's the easiest way to make a podcast with everything that you need all in one place. Let me explain. Anchor has tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. When hosting on Anchor, you can distribute your podcast on any listening platform like Spotify, Apple Podcast, and many, many more. It's everything that you need to make a podcast all in one place. And best of all, Anchor is totally free. Download the Anchor app today or go to anchor.fm to get started. Welcome to the Wartime Leadership Podcast, where we explore what spiritual resiliency looks like from different perspectives. We often focus on the physical, emotional, and social areas of resiliency, but often neglect the spiritual pillar. This looks different for everyone. We'll be exploring what spiritual resiliency looks like in the lives of our guests, who are people from all different walks of life. Today's episode is sponsored by Success Draft, where we help you transform your dreams into drafted plans. Head over to successdraft.com to get started today. Today's guest is very special for me. She has found it in her heart to mentor me in a lot of ways to help me kind of come up with the idea, the concept of this podcast. Uh, her and the entire team between uh, Llama Lounge all the way through to the Lima Charlie Network, this group of individuals is by far the greatest mentors because they want to be there for you and invest in you. Today, we have Nina Choi Romiller. Uh, she is a California girl native turned California girl. She's a former Air Force civil engineering officer and now is a supervising bridge engineer for the California Department of Transportation. She is also the vice chair of the American Welding Society Bridge Welding Committee. Wow, that is a mouthful in just that duty title and the... It is. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, we are blessed. We are honored to have Nina here. She is co-founder of the Llama Lounge podcast, as well as the Lima Charlie Network. Welcome, Nina. Thank you so much for having me, Nathan. Um, I am going to correct you a little bit, though. I am not a co-founder of the Llama Lounge. I'm a co-host. Um, I was actually brought on after uh, the other, um, my brothers had put it, put it all together and had founded it. So it had already been in in place for a couple of years. And then I I got to be a part of it after that. So but it's safe so to call you a llama. I am a llama. Yes. Now it's actually really interesting. We had Joe Bogdan on and he explained kind of where you all came up with the name or where the name was founded for Llama Leadership. And it's absolutely amazing. So go back and listen to that episode for that aspect alone. But you have truly helped me out a lot in moving forward with, with what I'm trying to do here. You've really helped craft that message. So I want to personally thank you for that. It's been my pleasure to be involved and to help you and support you and just to be, to consider you my brother, Nathan. So it's Absolutely awesome. awesome. Well, Nina, if you could just kind of walk us through your background, kind of what you do within the within your job as the supervising bridge engineer. So I got to take you guys a little, take everybody back a little bit because I, yes, I am an engineer. I'm a registered uh, professional engineer licensed in the state of California. However, I didn't even want to be an engineer. So, um, when I was in college, I think I picked engineering because I just needed to pick something and my cousins were engineers, but my real passion was law enforcement. I really wanted to help people. I wanted to make a difference. Um, and I thought that law enforcement would be my ticket for that, would be my path. 
Um, so in college, I, I worked at the police department. Um, even though I was studying engineering, I also did a summer internship with OSI, um, Air Force Office of Special Investigations. Um, and working at the police department, I got a chance to work with uh, the OSI team up at F.E. Warren Air Force Base a bit. So that was really, really cool. Um, but for anyone who is in the military or has been in the military, sometimes what you choose isn't what you get. So when it turned, uh, so when, when it came time to choose, you know, what my dream sheet, so to speak, and I picked the different career fields. I think I had OSI at the top, then security forces. Um, I think I had logistics, maintenance, everything on there except engineering. Because even though I had the degree or I was obtaining the degree, I really didn't want to be an engineer. I just never changed my degree because I didn't want to start all over again. So lo and behold, um, no surprise, Air Force said we have a dearth of Air Force civil engineering officers. So you win the golden ticket and you're going to be an engineer. Suck it. You're going to like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how it works that way, huh? It, it is. And even though it was not my choice at all, not even a, not a first, second, third, fourth, fifth, or sixth choice. Um, I actually found it to be completely different than what I had um, built it up in my head to be. I had it in my head that being an engineer was going to be stuck in an office in front of a computer every day, crunching numbers. And I really wanted to be outside and I really wanted to interact with people. And so um, I found out that being an Air Force civil engineer, I really got the opportunity to work with um, with our, our enlisted folks a lot more than I think other career fields may have. Hmm. Um, I want to say that the ratio of officers to enlisted was probably somewhere around like one to thir one to 20, one to 30. Um, so as an officer, you really, if you chose that path, you really could interact with your, your, your people a lot more. Hmm. And I found that I was able to make a difference and I was able to touch other people's lives. Um, so I found a roundabout way of really achieving what I, my passion was without being in the career field that I thought I had to be in to do that. Um, so I was in the Air Force for five years. I was a civil engineering officer, spent some time as a section commander. So I got to see the personnel side of things. Um, and then I, uh, went to go work for um, California Department of Transportation as a bridge engineer. Um, and I got to work on some really exciting projects. Again, I wasn't stuck in an office. I was out in the field. I got to go to a lot of different fabrication shops where they were making the parts and the pieces and humongous parts for these bridges. You know, 50 foot girders, 100 foot girders made out of steel. Um, uh, and it was there where I really got involved with uh, the welding side of things and with the American Welding Society. Um, so now, you know, I'm still engaged in all of that, even though now I, I find myself behind the desk a lot more than I did before. Um, but you still find ways to to make a difference and um, get engaged with people and and help them become better versions of themselves. So. Now, you actually kind of got to live out part of your criminal justice because you actually got your master's in engineering from Colorado State University, but then you got a master's in criminal justice from the University of Cincinnati, correct? I did. Yeah. I did. So you actually got to live out part of that and continue on with that law enforcement idea. I did. I did. And I think that's probably what may, maybe one of the things that sets me apart from most or you know the the general engineer cohort right um, most engineers are kind of geared towards numbers and things like that um, and I think that having a criminal justice masters just gives me a different perspective than mm. most engineers have um, 
you know, a lot of engineers get into engineering because it's, you're, you're kind of a numbers person, right? It's very black and white. Um, but regardless, you're still dealing with people and engineers are people also. And so I think being able to see, see things a little bit differently um, makes, makes you a little bit more um, effective mm. as an engineer when you're working with your stakeholders and working with other people. And even when you become an engineering manager and now you're managing staff and, and programs and, and things like that. And you've been able to actually do that by actually spearheading the leadership development program for the division of engineering, correct? Right. So that was kind of an idea that um, kind of was hatched by one of uh, one of our deputies um, and myself. And we just got to talking one day and we said, you know, we, we tend to put people in supervisory positions based on their technical expertise and how well they do on their interviews. But we do them a disservice because we don't we don't train them or we don't send them to supervisory training until after they've become supervisors. So how can we give people a taste of this or help give people an idea of what, um, what to anticipate before they become supervisors? How do we give them these tools? And so this is where, you know, developing some sort of a leadership program um, kind of took place. And so we started with, coming up with um, like different leadership topics and having leaders throughout the organization share their stories. And there, the idea was twofold. One, it would give aspiring leaders in our engineering division, um, the perspective of those who are, were, who were already established. Um, and it would then also give those who were already established an opportunity to mentor um, upcoming, you know, engineers and 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 folks that were aspiring leaders. Because if you don't use it, you lose it. And at exactly. a certain level, once you become, you know, a second line or third line supervisor, you lose touch with the folks that are really boots on the ground. And so that's a way to try to connect them again. Well, it's, a, it's an absolutely amazing idea. I mean, that's something that I personally think the Air Force and the, the other military branches have done a really good job about is developing those leaders younger in their careers. So, well, right. before we get going too far into this, I want to start with my five questions. These are five questions that my son Stanley helped me pick out from the apples to apples game. He randomly picked them out and then put them back in the box and then rechose other ones until he found the perfect ones. So what is one thing that you find repulsive? Ooh. Flies. Does it have to be a thing or does it have to be like a characteristic? No, it can be, it can be anything. So I find flies absolutely filthy and repulsive. I hate them. <laughs> is, is there I a story understand, behind that? I don't... You know, because I'm outdoors a lot and um, I love being outdoors, but I hate flies. I, I grew up, you know, with the idea that every creature, great and small, has its place and serves a purpose. You know, um, but flies, I can't figure out what their purpose is other than to leave disgusting little brown spots all over everything and get their disgusting, filthy bacteria and germ ridden feet all over your food in the summer. Wow, you are really feeling repulsed right now. Jeez, I yes, can feel I, it. I, yes, I find flies repulsive. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. And she is very, very serious about that. All right. What is in your online shopping cart right now that you have not bought? Um, can I pull up my Amazon cart right now? Because I think that there is something in there 
that I haven't bought. See, this is where we get interesting. This is when you can start to see, like, we're right on the edge of of, of pulling, pushing the trigger, ready to ready to jump, and not quite there. So, what I have in my Amazon cart right now are some Shocks Open Run Mini Bone Conduction Open Ear Bluetooth headphones. Oh, I just haven't pulled the trigger yet. Now, why? Well, um, so we may get this into get into this a little bit later, but I love to run. Um, I'm I'm a runner. I'm always outside running, and sometimes I do want to hear, you know, um, listen to music or listen to a podcast or listen to a book. But I run on the trails. I run outside most of the time, and so you never quite want to be so um, in the zone and that you don't know what's going on around you. And you can't hear what's going on around you. And so that's why I was thinking maybe about getting some of these bone conduction earphones because you can still hear mm-hmm. what's going on around you in addition to what's on your phone. So that's actually cover. what I use. I actually use the the Bluetooth mm-hmm. bone conducting. It's absolutely amazing. Um, what is what do you love about your job? I actually love working with people. I love the people that I work with. Um, although this morning I had a meeting and put it into question for for a little bit. But in general, 99.99% of the time, you know, I do love the people that I work with and I love their perspectives. Um, I love being able um, you know, to to see what I can do to help them or help them with their issues. Uh, find solutions to different problems, collaborate with them. You know, for many of us, we spend more time with our coworkers um, than than sometimes our own families. And we often find that our coworkers become like our family. Mm. They're your work family. And it makes it just so much better when you enjoy the people that you work with, we sure have some dysfunctions, you know, but every family does. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, on the flip side of that question, what is one thing that you would leave your job for? In a more interesting challenge. Um, I wouldn't leave my job because of the people, but if I, if I were to find, um, an opportunity where maybe I could have a greater impact, um, or something that was maybe more challenging, I think I, that would, that would be something I I would, I would maybe leave my job for. Okay. Okay. That's admirable. We'll say that. Now, I have written down what I believe to be the answer to the next question. Okay. Who is your favorite superhero? She looks deep in thought, folks. This is. I'm thinking very hard here. Um, I have a lot of favorite superheroes. I grew up reading comic books. So, you know, when a lot of kids were out hanging out with their friends or, you know, out riding bikes, I was downstairs with my dad's comic book collection. So I have a lot of favorite superheroes. Um, one of my favorite superheroes of all time was Storm of the X-Men. You know, growing up, um, there weren't a lot of I think you probably had more male superheroes than female superheroes. So Storm being female, I gravitated towards her. Um, And she was also the leader of the X-Men. So that was, I think, something that also was very, um, something I gravitated to, to as well. Not only was she a female superhero, but she was also the leader of a team and she was fearless. Hmm. So storm. 
yes, I was way off. So I'm just going to put this notebook off to the side. I thought it would be the flash. I thought it would be the flash. I mean, I looked at, at <laughs> you. You ran in an amazing race uh, last week. Absolutely amazing. Like you ran like what, like 2000 miles or something like that? No, no, no? not yet. Not yet. Um, I did run in Zion. I did a half marathon with my uh, one of my girlfriends from high school uh, last weekend. And I do have a 100K um, scheduled for the end of April. Okay, 100K. Hmm. Never will I ever put myself through that. You know, it's funny because I actually met a gentleman during the run yes, last week. Um, and we, we got to talking about running on the trails and doing ultra running and things like that. And he told me that since he turned 69, he had run 40 ultra marathons, including a number of hundred milers. Wow. Okay. Exactly. And I'm 42. So if he can do that at 69, I, okay. It was pretty amazing. I was, I was floored and then he became one of my superheroes. <laughs> Challenge accepted. I got it. All right, Nina. Well, let's, let's start getting into back into the meat of this, this conversation. I am very interested in this. I, I ask all my guests about their leadership style because we each have a different way of leading and you having transitioned from the military side to the civilian side, what is your leadership style? You know, my leadership style really hasn't changed changed much um, from when I was in the military. Um, I've always been the type of person that has said, I will never ask my team, my subordinates to do something that I wouldn't be willing to do. Um, you know, I will say that Transitioning from the military to the civilian side really challenges your leadership ability because when you're on the civilian side, you don't automatically have that rank structure um, that's drummed into you to fall back on anymore. Mm -hmm. Now you're dealing with outside um, uh, effects like unions, right? Right. Before you could, you had a hammer as a, as as a supervisor. If somebody didn't listen to you, then they were being insubordinate, and they could get written up, and, and there were certain disciplinary actions. It takes much more on the civilian side before disciplinary actions can occur, and um, very often you will have employees that will go to their union if there's a disagreement between themselves and and their and their supervisors. So as a leader, I think it's really stretched me a lot more. Um, I've learned how to, I think, be a much more effective communicator um, and to really explain the why of things. Um, I do believe that you have to be able to establish that trust with your team. And hmm. so my leadership style, I think, is very grounded in establishing trust and mutual respect. And you can't do that if you're not good for your word and your people need to understand, they need to trust that when you say you are going to do something, that you are going to do it. If you're going to have their back, then you're going to have their back. If you're going to advocate for them, that you're going to advocate for them. Hmm. Um, they they need to understand that even if the answer is you know i don't have an answer but i'll find out the humble leader the humble leader i don't know the answer but i'm gonna find out and i'm gonna get back to you you have to be genuine to engender that trust because let's be honest they'll see right through you if you aren't and we've all worked for someone who we dang near we Dang well knew they didn't have the answer, mm -hmm. but they puffed their chest out and said, well, here's the way it's going to be. Well, that doesn't engender trust at all. Mm -mm. <laughs> mm -mm. Mistrust. 
So, so I think that's, that's typically my leadership style, my leadership philosophy. Well, that's, that's now, nice. Go ahead. I have not, very rarely do we get to the point where I have to take the gloves off. And I have, and I can, but that's never the default. Walk softly, but carry a big stick. Uh, <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt, absolutely one of the greatest one-liner <laughs> presidents of all time, by gosh. Uh, all right. Hey, what comes to mind when you think about spiritual resiliency? You know, it's funny because, um, you know, when you and I have talked about this before, I didn't grow up particularly religious. You know, when I talked about flies earlier and how all animals have a purpose, um, it comes from my background. At, you know, my mother was Buddhist. So we, I guess I was raised Buddhist growing up. Um and, and, but, but, you know, I, I was never really practicing. It's just something that I was around and maybe I picked, picked up little bits and pieces. Um, but I think for me, you know, spiritual resilience, um, when there's something, something that impacts your spirit, and then that's where you have to define what, what is, what is spirit? What is your spirit? Right. And I don't think that there's words that can really convey what that is, but there's something inside of all of us, right? It's maybe you call it a soul. Um, uh, maybe it's just like some sort of something that just kind of sits right here, right above your heart. That's always there, but something that, that, that impacts your heart so profoundly that you now have to figure out how do I keep moving forward? Hmm. So, so how do you build that inside of yourself? What's it look I like think, for you? Yeah. So I think that you have to believe that there's something bigger than yourself. Right. Um, when you maybe have been so grounded in the here and now and things that are tangible and, you know, bad things happen in the world, whatever they may be, things that don't have a reason. That's where I think spiritual resiliency comes into play, because sometimes bad stuff happens and there is no reason why hmm. there's no logic to it. You know, I'm an I'm an engineer, so I logically speaking should be logical, right? <laughs> um, but but spirituality isn't necessarily logical. It asks you to believe in something that you can't see, that you can't put your hands on, that you can't necessarily hear. It's just something that you just have to have that belief in. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, maybe, the, you know, an example of spiritual resilience is, you know, I, I think I told you about this when we, when we first met, um, my stepson passed away about four years ago. And we were exceptionally close because I never had kids of my own. And, you know, he was my buddy and we did everything together. And he would hide my Amazon packages from my husband for me. So I wouldn't get in trouble for spending too much money. You know, he was, you know, the one that uh, would listen to like all my old CDs together with me and things like that. Right. Um, so, so his loss when he passed away um, suddenly was, was very tough and, there was no logic to that. He was 20, 
three years old. Um, and he was in relatively good health. I mean, we thought he was. He was born with a congenital defect, heart defect, um, but otherwise was doing fine. He had seen his cardiologist uh, about two weeks before and cardiologist said everything was fine with him. So, um, you know, there's no logic when you lose somebody that young. There's just no logic to it. It does not make sense. And if you try to find a reason why, you'll just go crazy. And so that's where I think spiritually, you have to dig a little bit deeper um, to find, to come back from, from that heartache, from that, from that, uh, from that, that type of a blow. And you have to believe that there's something bigger out there. Um, you know, for me, there's little things every day. Now, my, my sister-in-law told me um, when her father passed, my, my husband's dad passed, um, she would find quarter, like coins just in random places, places where they, where they didn't belong, right? And she said she knew that was her father's way of saying, hi, I'm here, I'm still here. And after she told me that, I started finding pennies. You know, you've heard the saying pennies from heaven. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I would find pennies all over the place, just random places. And, you know, one could logically say, maybe I just misplaced it, but what, what's the fun in that? That mm -hmm. takes the joy out of things. Right. And, and I think that being able to believe that it was Josh and I still believe it to that day, right? To, to this day, it's it's Josh saying, "Hey, I'm here. Just letting you know you're not alone." Um, there's there's a lot of comfort to that, and I think we need that as as human beings. Um, to be able to to realize that that there's life isn't finite, and there's a piece of all of us that still somehow exists beyond our corporeal selves, right? Mm -hmm. Whether that's the legacy that you leave and the lives that you touch, whether that's pennies, you know, that you leave for your loved ones or, you know, for, for me, and we talked about my being a runner, you know, I don't like mornings. I really hate mornings. <laughs> I do. They're the worst. I would love to be able to sleep in, but I do get up early in the morning and I'll, I'll go running and um, I run sometimes um, in these, these absolutely gorgeous hills. And you, if you get there at the right time, you see the sun rising right over the hills and just the way that it hits. And it's not quite up there in the sky. It's like halfway behind the hill. And so you, it, it partially, um, you know, illuminates you know, uh, the grass and, and everything. And, and it's almost like there's a halo around it. Yeah. And when you see something like that, how can you not believe that there's something bigger than ourselves? How can I not look at that and say, you know what? That is Josh. That's, those are my loved ones. there. just saying they're here. They're with us. It's almost like they painted a picture across the sky, knowing you were there in that moment. Right. And so when everything is silent, when it's just you, right, whether it's, you know, out in the hills running, or maybe you go on a walk at night and you look up at the stars and it's just you and what's surrounding you, right? The, the, the nature or, or whatever. If you just quiet your mind, and just soak all that in. You feel something there. Hmm. And you feel how small you are in this big, 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 big world. And how can there not be something bigger than us? Hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, 
I have had the pleasure of receiving a text from you when you the last time we talked, you went out for runs right thereafter. And you actually went to those hills and you sent a picture to me of what it looked like from your vantage point just and and you said see and i and i looked at this picture and you could just see how beautifully laid out the landscape was how it is just a way to be able to to dump your mind to kind of just step back for a minute and go wow and then of course i turned around and went on a run and we're on opposite coasts and in my neighborhood, there's about 26 miles worth of trails and it goes one goes around a lake and it is in within our neighborhood. And I sent a picture to you to say, and this is my view that I get to see. Yes. And even though we're looking at two separate coasts, we're looking at the exact same thing because it's it's that moment when we can can dump in 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 resiliency. We forget that sometimes those those pillars overlap. Mm -hmm. They overlap a lot. Um. That's that's beautiful observation, Nina. Beautiful observation. What was it in that moment that helped you? The the moment of your worst pain that you felt. Uh, what was that time when you had to rely mostly on that spiritual resiliency to just kind of push push you through? And what did you do? You know. Um... I would, I mean, I told my, every single time I would see the sunrise or I would find a penny or I would look up at the stars, right? And I would talk to him. I would tell him that I missed him. And I would tell him that I knew he was looking down on me. And in those moments where it was just me and the world and me talking to Josh through the sunset or the sunrise or the stars or whatever, it was like I could feel his arms around me hugging me. Mm. Right. And so in that way, when you can find, you know, the things that you've lost or the people that you've lost, um, in in these moments they're never really gone that's 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 how i keep him in my heart um that's how i stay centered right you know when there's days where i feel like everything is just falling apart sometimes all you need to do is go back go outside and, and just take take a deep breath not just any deep breath, right? You, you, you really just breathe in what's around you in that silence. In, in, um, and it really, for me, it really helps to center me and it helps bring me back, um, back to earth, so to speak, right? So yeah, I don't think I answered your question. I kind of just kind of went off on a tangent. <laughs> no, I, I think you did. And I, I think you really did. You know, we, we talk about how we push through, how we overcome. And and for you, spiritual resiliency looks like a walk or a run and just a moment to be able to mentally release. No, and I think we talked about it before because it looks different for everyone, right? And I think I told you, you know, I'm I'm, I'm a fairly logical person, didn't grow up very religious. But that for me is what helps center me. Whereas, you know, my, I have family members that are very religious. And so what helps them, what helped them through loss was praying, prayer, you know, um, and, and, and speaking to God. And that was their way. Mm. Um, but regardless of what it is for each one of us, it does bring us to the same place where it helps center us and bring us peace again. Hmm. Mm. Powerful words, powerful just to be able to take us on that, on that journey. You know, it's, it's important that we not let any one of those pillars crumble. Right. 
because if we, I mean, as, as an engineer, and we talked about this before, as an engineer, you know, probably better than anyone here that if your house is built on a foundation or on, on the pillar system, and one of those pillars starts to give way and is damaged, eventually the whole thing is just going to come down because one pillar has that much effect on the entirety of the system. Exactly. And whether you it's have the to have a firm foundation. And if it's if it's if it's any one of them, the spiritual, the physical, the mental, the social, it doesn't matter. You and and being able to recognize that in other people, which is something that I think that you have brought to where you work is is that aspect of you've got to care about the people. You've got to see beyond those numbers. You do, you know, engineers regardless. Um You know, they may be engineers, they may be very logical, they may be very analytical, but at the end of the day, they are human beings. Mm. And human beings, we all have the same basic needs. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm going to read an excerpt from Live Outside Your Cage, which is a blog that you wrote, Nina, for Llama Leadership. And I, and I love it because it speaks to me a lot. It says, often in our lives, things don't turn out the way that we think they should or the way we want. When we let our disappointments limit our abilities and options, we let our perceptions of what things might be cloud the possibilities of what can be. The cages aren't our jobs or our careers or even where we find ourselves in life. Our cages are our expectations and attitudes that the situations of the situations we are in. And often our cages are our belief that we must live and operate within the confines of what others expect of us. Absolutely powerful words just to I mean, and that is just a short excerpt that I could have taken from an amazing article that you wrote. Um, I am grateful for your mentorship. I'm grateful for you for taking the time to invest in me, uh, you and Trip and and Noble and just the entire team over at Lima Charlie have really taken a hold and, and helped me through this journey. So as we end this episode, Nina, I want to know what are you currently reading or any recommendations you have? So I I downloaded a bunch of books on my way to Utah this this weekend, and some of them are, unfortunately, popcorn for your brain. Um, So we won't get into those. Um, But One of the books that I um, am going through right now is called The Hiding Place, and it's by a woman named Corey Ten Boom. Um, She was uh, not a Jew um, during World War II, but her family helped hide um, Jews um, in, in her community during World War II. And as a result, her family wound up going to the concentration camps, but they were so firmly, um, they so firmly believed um, spiritually and religiously that it was the right thing to do to help their fellow man, that they were willing to do this. And it's just absolutely amazing to read about the courage of ordinary people um, to do what is morally right um, in the face of absolutely horrible and insurmountable odds. Um, and it breaks your heart, but it gives you hope. And it's not unlike some of the stories that a lot of us are hearing and seeing right now on the news of, of human beings helping others. So that is, that's what I'm reading right now. <laughs> Oh, well, that is really good. Any other recommendations you have for us? Um, I recommend this book to everybody. And it's one of my favorite books ever. It's the book of joy. And it is um, basically a accounting of the dialogue um, between the Dalai Lama and the 
um, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And they talk about how to find joy as human beings and what keeps us from finding it. And um, yeah, it's an unbelievably amazing book and probably, probably one of my favorite ones by two, two uh, but, people and, I, I admire greatly. And with the passing of uh, the Archbishop uh, Tutu, this is perfect timing for that. So we will have both of those in the comments and in the description of this episode. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been blessed as much as I have because I, I've been over here just taking note after note after note because anytime that I talk to Nina, I know I'm going to get fed. So <laughs> I know I want to be able to write down and, and have seconds for later. So thank you so much for being on today uh, and for mentoring me personally. I'm, I'm very grateful to you. I am so very grateful to you for being in my life as well and for for having me on here and just uh just being a brother it the honor is all mine is, i was actually about to say the exact same oh, thing to you you know what it's a good thing we don't yeah, say yeah. at the same time because then we jinx each other and then that would be awkward <laughs> and that's how we know that we our family. Thank you, folks, for listening to another episode of the Wartime Leadership Podcast. Catch you next week.